All right, everyone. Going to give a bit of a, a talk on uh, data here at uh, Vendasta. We deal with a little bit of it. So uh, I like this. I found this quote when I was looking for how to start this talk. And I don't think uh, Vendasta maybe is big data yet, but we do deal with a lot of it. So Vendasta at our data, we're dealing with many things. There are millions of rows of data, like 56 million listings, uh, just active historical. We've looked up over 167 million just to store in our database. 201 million uh, mentions active in historical. So we are storing a lot of data in different ways. So we've been doing this for a while, and so we have some heritage to this. And we started out an app engine. An app engine has some limitations. An app engine, just in the basic process, you had 60 seconds to process whatever you're doing in a request. And if you're trying to work with a lot of data, 60 seconds isn't enough. You could work with some other tools and maybe get 10 minutes or longer, but 60 seconds was the usual. So what did we do? There was this uh, first tool we worked with. It was called Phantasm. So what it would do is a finite state machine kind of flow. Finite state machine is you have a state. You stay in that state until a condition changes it. So you can see on the one side, there's a, a finite state machine of an ant game where the ant would stay at home until he, a leaf was nearby and then he'd go out and get a leaf unless this cursor came near and then he'd run away until the cursor was far enough away to find the leaf and then go home again. So you, you stay in a state, you move through it until you uh, move through all the states. So that was paired with uh, task queues in the App Engine world and task queues allowed you some control and you could build up work. So it's basically a queue, you make a line and then you have workers that could process one, each one as you go and you could build more workers to scale out and do more. Uh, one of the biggest downsides of this is uh, it was all defined by a YAML file and it was very declarative, but made it really hard to understand at times, especially when you're coming back to it and like, how, does it, how is this organized? What do you have to do here? Where, what do you have to change? So we changed this, uh, a new technology came, map reduced pipelines. Uh, basically you put stuff in one side of a pipe or uh, multiple entrances to that pipe. It transformed it along the way and it output the other side. Uh, our next speaker, Kevin, wrote the best articles on this. Uh, so if you really wanna know more, he can really help you out. Uh, and along the way, this stored a lot of things in uh, Google's data store to record where everything was at. And this was a bit of a downside. It also was abandoned by Google, so they stopped supporting it and uh, we were left on our own. We're still using it a bit, but it's not a preferred technology anymore. So where have we gone? Where would we do now? Uh, Google then uh, put some time into what they call data flows. Uh, and now they've re re renamed it uh, Apache Beam as they open sourced it to bring a wider audience to uh, data flows. So what are data flows? Again, it's the pipeline model where you're extracting, transforming, and loading, but they take care of a lot of the scaling for you. And you can uh, see on the one side, there's an example of a data flow. Uh, you can't quite make it out, but uh, at the top on the one side, it says the job time, and that's 11 hours, but then you can't make it out very well. The total C virtual CPU time is 170 hours, so it's really scaled out for us, and it's, it's done a lot of that work for us. So data flows come in two flavors. It's Python and Java. Uh, and a little bit about that is we found that uh, the Python language that they implemented it's always behind. So if you wanted the latest features to try out the newest things, you just had to wait another six months or a year to get them. So that meant we mostly stick to the Java side. Uh, we're not a Java shop here. So uh, some of us have written Java in the past, but it's not our first language anymore. So it's a bit different for us and it uses generics and the fluent style a lot. And that can get a bit deep in a while, after a while. And the last bit is the documentation's poor for it. So it's like, you're not, you're working in Java every day and the documentation isn't that great. So you're struggling a bit, but once you get through it, you can start to recognize the pattern. As you can see, this is a bit of code snippet here. And it's a pretty simple code snippet it's from their example. It's reading from uh, Google Cloud Storage to read a Shakespeare uh, play. It's extracting all the words from that play. And it's just 
spitting them out is a different word. So each word that comes through, it gets counted. And then it's spit out. So every word like the would appear 300 times. And then it gets written out to a different file. So it's a real simple concept. Once you understand how it's written, it's not that hard to read. But it, it, with the Java generics, it gets a bit uh, deep after a while. So in the Apache Beam world, and Google ha is open source, that means it can be run in many places. So Spark, Flink, and Apex are other choices to run your Dataflow or your Apache Beam projects. Dataflow is what's hosted by Google, and you can see a picture on the one side of the, how it fits into the Google infrastructure world. And Google has put a, a bit more effort into it. Google has this other tool called Google uh, Data Prep. Our very own Dustin Walker has worked with that. So that actually generates a data flow. And uh, here's the data flow that uh, data prep actually generates. You can see it starts at the top on the one side. It fans out like eight wide as it's processing everything, fans back into a single flow, fans out again, fans back in to finally give a, a separate flow. So in data prep, it's actually a program de developing that flow. So each of those little tasks is just a small transform along the way as it finally brings out the final data that you want. It's turned out to be a useful tool for him. So we found with data flows that if you combine them with uh, PubSub, PubSub is all kind of like those task queues I talked about in Phantasm, which is building up a queue of items to work on, but it also is listened to by anywhere else in our infrastructure. So that allows us to write this in any language we want. So we're not stuck with Java or Python. We can PubSub work on this little bit. And then we can have a, a Golang service, which is our preferred language now, to actually do the work. And the other nice thing is it can take more time. So you can even scale more. So if what we need to do, we're not in a hurry to do it, PubSub it out. And then it'll flow, sit in this durable queue, and we can process it at the speed we want to process it at. So what have we done with it so far? I think our first early win was uh, we were working with uh, one of our partners and they had a list of 50,000 businesses they're working with and they wanted to know a bit more about those businesses. And internally, we have this thing called Data Lake, which is uh, more information we know about businesses out in the world. So we took that data com of all the businesses, combined it with our data, bake, data lake and spit out on the other side extra information so we could help that partner know more about those businesses. Next thing we did, uh, a team started working on a project. They defined their data structure, got 35 million records in it. Then they decided this data structure isn't quite right because early days, you're not quite sure how to structure things. So we could take that 35 million records, go through it, pub set it out, and then they did the update in all 35 million records. Lastly, just in our last hackathon, Cody Kurz and Dale Birch. Remember when I talked about map reduce pipelines, put out a lot of extra data in a data store? Well, it turns out there was eight terabytes of that data. And previously, it was more expensive to delete that data than to keep it. The math has changed. Now it's cheaper to delete it than keep it. So with, uh, with the data flow, we went through all that and deleted eight ter terabytes. So I think that was a, a good win for us. But I know some of you, uh, think, but I have SQL, I can merge or join all my tables together and do all kinds of operations in SQL. I don't need something as fancy as Dataflow. Maybe that's true, but in our world, we're moving to microservices. Microservices typically own all their own data, so it's a separate database for every microservice. So that already starts forcing you, how am I going to do operations that span different databases? So this is a tool that you can use for that. In-house, in we have many different types of databases. We have BigQuery, Bigtable, Elasticsearch, Data Store, Cloud Storage. So we have data in many different forms. This allows us to bring those different forms together and work on them together. Likewise, SQL can do many things, but it's limited in what it can do. And sometimes, once you're in a programming language, you can do lots of different things. You can filter and transform in many different ways. You're not limited by the SQL language. It's easy fan out and fan in to bring it all together and tear it apart the way you want to. Where we can go next with this is uh, real time. And with real time, eventually, so much data is coming in, you can't handle it all at once. 
you got to start windowing it and breaking it into the parts as you go. So on that one uh, bottom picture, you can see if all the input was just handled at once, it's just tiny dots. But if you start windowing it, you gather all those yellow dots in the one spot and take that group and do the function together in that one group. And then you save it to your storage going out to uh, really cut down on the reads. On the other side, once you start doing that, and even in the other situations, you've got to start thinking about when things happen with versus when things are processed, thinking of the skew. So in streaming, it's in the next step we probably have to take. It's, it's the step on the way to things like Lambda. But in all those cases, you got to start thinking the skew between when things happen and when they're processed. And uh, those are two really good articles if you're really getting into streaming. Great. Thank you.